Thank you so much for having me today. Um, and thank you for the warm welcome. So as you heard, I have quite a bit of experience with the internet as a journalist, as a student of political science, and just as being someone my age. I come from potentially the last generation to have had a childhood without being completely online. And my version of technology today is how my life has been because of the internet and the reasons I'm wanting to reconsider my relationship with it. Specifically in that, I definitely think that there's a need to talk about the social. Yet, I wouldn't be here with you guys today had it not been for a company I'm going to talk quite a bit about today, Google. In 2013, almost 10 years ago, I wrote this into a Google search, how to move to Spain legally. And here I am. I somehow made it. <laughs> and it was Google's help. So in this, I recognize that I live in an interesting space and piece of time. I was able to grow up without having an iPad when I had my breakfast watching YouTube videos, which ironically is quite funny on the internet right now. It's a big meme. <laughs> um, so not having this kind of gave me this opportunity to have a duality in my life, a dichotomy of before tech and after tech. And it's easy to identify how my life has changed because of it, and sometimes fairly difficult to remember how life was before it. And obviously that comes from having grown up with it from a fairly young age, adolescence hit, YouTube was already taking off, I had my first social media by 13, which actually was a website that required HTML coding. <laughs> Now talking with a bunch of very brilliant brains today, I really regret not having remembered how to code. But in this, I also recognize that I have a fascinating dichotomy with my relationship in the internet. I grew up with it, and we're friends and foes. I think of it in good and bad, and I think that there's a really great opportunity to take a look at the moment that we're living through and ask, what is this? This is the future. It was someone's future. It was my future. And here I am, standing in front of you today, wondering, what do I do now? Do I keep in this trajectory, or do we make some changes? So one thing that we've afforded to these companies that we interact with on a daily basis, I'm sure everyone in the audience, I highly doubt anyone could tell me they don't have social media or use Google in the room. So I was going to initially ask, but I think It'd be better to ask who doesn't. Anyone? Yeah. So we've afforded them a level of power, and we have to start analyzing what that means. So power is a social authority or a control, especially that exercised by a government. OK, you're going to say, tech companies aren't government, so what are you trying to get at? Well, what's interesting is, in any period, we have a upheaval when it comes to new change and new technologies. Obviously, social media is a new technology. Governments in their day were new technologies. They're difference and innovations that stem from different eras. So the Treaty of Westphalia, I'm a political nerd, so I have to give you guys some good political data here. In 1648 was a separation, essentially, of church and state for the first time. You might remember it more for its role in ending wars, but at the same time, it re-established that people were able to be their own keepers. They didn't need to rely on a demigod or a monarch. And from that, we entered the Enlightenment, which was the 17th, era, 17th century era, in which we started asking pretty big questions and ended up with democracy again for the first time since the ancient Greeks. And democracy has been pretty nice. It also brought forth revolutions, so states decided to move in a different direction. And from this level of being able to make your own thoughts and decisions and question who you are, and Kant famously asked, what even was enlightenment, which we're asking today, what is our technological revolution? You had the Industrial Revolution, an era in which people were suddenly moving towards productivity, and productivity brought forth questions of exploitation. So another political movement, another way of thinking. And in this 19th to 20th century period, you had the first two world wars, luckily the only two world wars. But the interwar period was interesting in itself because it birthed the shift to the international system that we live in today. 
It was the start of the League of Nations. It didn't really work out. The Americans didn't love it. And then later, the UN. And from there, you start to see that ideological struggle shifts its way in. Ideological struggle ends up creating in itself our move to technology because we start having intense bipolar competition. Bipolar competition allotted for the ARPNET to be, which later in 1983 became our internet. And in this period, things started to move a little bit slower, but innovation was huge, and nuclear weapons became quite an important piece of statecraft. And in such, we had supercomputers that needed to run them. And now that supercomputer is likely less powerful than what you have in your pocket. So this technological revolution that we've experienced in the last 10 years has been very different of the sort. We talked about being able to talk into our watches, something I actually do fairly regularly. But in that, there's also a need to discuss the shift towards a couple small companies, big companies, small quantity of companies, who hold all of this power. Monopoly of power used to be a state concept. Today, it's not so sure. So. Again, what is power? It's a social authority or control, especially exercised by a government. Easy. So who, what do you think of when you think of power in the room? Probably a president, maybe a CEO. Money can afford you quite a bit of power. What about the Vatican? Something that we just mentioned had a lot of power, was kind of given to the people at one point during the Treaty of Westphalia. And then you can think of capitalism which I'm sure most of you don't go to your job sheerly out of the desire to be the best that you can be. We are all required to be a part of the structure and the power system that capitalism is. And these are all examples of top-down power, which is how we interact with it, or at least know it, because it's an abstract concept. I highly doubt many of you have taken the time to address what you think power actually is. And here are a couple of examples of classic political thought and philosophy that highlight that you need to look at power as a top-down structure. The aristocracy from Aristotle, the Machiavelli prince story, the Leviathan, which keeps us from the state of nature, which is the state of anarchy, and then the social contract, Rousseau's famous concept that we still operate under today. All of this means someone needed to be above you to keep you in line. But I don't think that's quite exactly true. I think that power actually stems from your social interactions and the people that you surround yourself with and the ideas that you share with those people. So I would like to change the definition of power. It's a social authority or a control that's built throughout the fabrics of society. The actions one takes built upon the actions of previous actions. Here's a quote. It is the total structure of actions brought to bear upon possible actions. It incites it induces, it seduces, it makes easier or more clear or more difficult a set of actions upon other actions. Essentially what this is saying, in a very nice post-structural way of doing so, it's Foucault, of course, is that essentially anything that you decide was already in part predetermined for you. We don't start from absolutely zero, we start from a basis of social strata. You have your family, you have your friends, you have your church sometimes, you have your educational institutes. And in this, you're born with a predisposition to make certain choices. And what's interesting is Foucault used this example to describe how power actually interacts and works with us at a government level. So you might think, oh, well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Obviously, the government's top down. It's not. At some point, you have an ability that Government no longer needs to operate top-down. You reinforce exactly what rules society has already set for us. If you don't, you're not guaranteeing yourself a nice life while you're here. And that's interesting because that's pastoral power. That's what the church had previously. The church promised an afterlife, making it to the good life. And so in that, you followed the church. They gave you the, your instructions. You were a moral person. And at some point, you'd reach the good life. And now, in your social circles, you're reinforcing that same exact idea to make sure that your life is good here. So power is relations. And in it being relations, you should start beginning to think of it in 
here's a nice metaphor. I was going to use a web because, you know, the internet and everything. But I think if you take a look at this picture, you might not see a lot more than a forest. What I see is a plant, the vine, which is very prolific and capable of spreading and copying and creating a blanket over everything. And in doing so, what we're looking at is the same way our brains operate with synopsis. So you have a small idea that mutilates and becomes a bigger idea. You share the idea with another person, the other person shares an idea with that person. And in doing so, you're creating the social web of ideas that we all live through in terms of power and its relations. And this is really unique in the age of social media. Why? You used to have your friends, your family, your educational institutes, and the church build and reinforce who you are as a person. And these old ideas of power, of these questions of top-down, how to be ruled, how strict, by who, to what ends, they're all very Machiavellian. They're not necessary also either in this definition of power. And in this shift, essentially what happens is power is exercised by some onto others, and the system is multiplied when you start looking at how we operate with social media. You no longer have a small social, social circle. The people in your social circle are essentially multiplied at an infinite level and a globalized level. The internet is boundless, and there's not a lot of sovereignty in this space. So your circle of influence no longer is the well-established social circles and social strata that you had of previous times. So rather than the forest covered in ivy, you're looking at infinite code. There's no change. There's consistent repetition. So this creates a conundrum. So if I'm arguing that society has all of the power at this point in time, there has to be still a relationship with government. The government needs the society to continue in line with its ideas. As all of us probably are quite aware, ideas have been shifting because we have the internet. So ideas that we might not have shared prior, or conspiracy theories, for example, might not have been quite as popular when you had to go to the library and read five books about a specific theory. But today, someone can say something on the internet, and an algorithm is going to direct you to that due to the fact that at one point in time, you expressed on Google a question of the autonomy you have within a government system. And in that, tech finds itself in the middle, exploiting a very unique relationship. Everything you do online is recorded. You cannot like a picture, you cannot hover over a link for more than five seconds without that going into a data file on you. And in doing so, tech finds itself then reconstructing how we interact with our own groups, our own social groups, and then also how we're interacting with the government. We change our opinions on government, but at the same time, government now operates by providing us information through tech companies like Meta and Al Alphabet. And in doing so, the government is also grappling with its own loss of sovereignty, which is a key principle in terms of international relations. If you live in an online world, there are no bounds and boundaries to what you can do. There are no level of sovereignty on the internet. And so this creates a very unique problem. And in doing so, you have to start to wonder, how does this even happen? Well, the tech companies are relying on our ideas and our social stratas, but they operate in a way that's invisible to us, and we're always visible to them. So this is our future. It's our here and now. This influence is redirected itself through Google's, a number one followed by 100 zeros, of channels and algorithms, which all perfectly craft who you are and reinforce a perfect version of you to fit into a more homogenous society. And maybe homogeny doesn't seem that bad, but if you really start to think about it, when it's at a globalized level, there's not going to be a lot of room for innovation or difference. So I recommend that you take back your own level of autonomy. And how can you do that? It's quite simple, actually. Why don't you read a book? Go for a run? Ride a bicycle? <laughs> Paint, all of these things seem a little bit silly, but building up hobbies that don't rely on time spent online really provides us a special place. 
And in doing so, what you're doing is you're re deconstructing the uh, puzzle they've made of you, and you're building back the pieces of your own puzzle. Analog. So I'm going to leave you with a quote. Underneath my outside face, there's a face that none can see. A little less smiley, a little less sure, but a whole lot more like me. Let's try and find ourselves offline. <laughs>